Hello everybody. I've got good and I've got bad news. <laughs> okay, fun fact. Um, I've lost my wallet. So the bad news is that this vlog, this video, this episode of Lost in Laos is a complete disaster from start to finish. Everything went wrong. I apologise in advance, although I am going to still upload it because I think within the carnage is a few interesting things to learn. And, you know, sometimes it's just funny to watch people struggle, isn't it? <laughs> you see, I had really high hopes that this was going to be the highlight of the whole series, actually, because this place, Phon Safan in central Laos, is home to two chapters of human history, one very sombre and very secret, and the other one is a complete mystery. Nobody really knows anything. It's all speculative, a guess at best. And so we're gonna solve the mystery of these jars today. But as you'll see during this video, it's kind of difficult to tell you the story and relay the information to you without being able to A, get to the location itself and B, um, just not be in the right uh, frame of mind to tell a factually interesting story what they've discovered actually the french archaeologist um archaeological archaeologist let's begin with the first place that i wanted to take you which was a disused old aircraft strip that was used during a secret war but it is 88 kilometers away and as you'll see very difficult to reach Okay then, let's talk about the first place that I tried to go to and unfortunately failed miserably at. Now, quickly, let's take a look at the map. In the middle here, you can see where I'm trying to go. This is Long Tien. It sits bang in the middle, actually, between Vang Vieng, the super popular touristy backpacker place that we were at earlier in the series, and Phon Safan, the place that I'm at currently. And as you can see on Google Maps, there is a road there, so I thought it would be easy to reach. 80 kilometers, or about two and a half hours, through the mountain roads. And as you can see here, this is the footage of me explaining about where we're going to go and what we're going to do and why it's so interesting. But because the road was so bad, um, my microphone was kind of like half in the GoPro, half out the GoPro because of the bouncing, uneven surfaces. So the audio was wrecked, unfortunately. But the significance of this place is it's one of the most secret locations in the world because it was hidden until very recently because this was the base that the Lao army, backed by the CIA, were based at because they were attacking the Communist Party, the Vietnamese Communist Party, and, you know, the Americans were trying their best to make sure that Laos didn't fall to the Communist Vietnamese because obviously China had already gone, Russia was there to the north of China and now Vietnam was turning communist. The Americans really feared that Lao would fall and then it would basically be a domino effect. Here's a very well established historian who explains it a little bit better than I can. The reason why Lao was important was during that time uh, there was the Red Scare, right? So basically, fear communism. Communism gonna communism gonna dominate Southeast Asia. We already have China there, and so you have North Vietnam. Now it's a communist state, and so if the country of Laos falls, then the rest of that region would fall to communism. It would turn red. So it's the domino theory, right? So if one domino falls, the rest of them would fall. And as you'll see later in this episode when we go to the Plain of Jars where there are lots of remnants of this battle and this war, these two stories of Long Tien and the Plain of Jars are in a way linked. And I really wanted to get to this airfield. It looked beautiful. It was full of history. But as you can see, unreachable on Zelda. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to make it to... Long Tien airfield. I've been driving for um, 90 minutes on the world's worst road and I kept going, I kept pushing and I knew that it was destroying my bike um, but Zelda, <sighs> let, let me show you what's happened. Basically I, I travel with a, ignore the helmet covered in mud, um, as I was parking my helmet fell and rolled down the hill. So about 10 minutes ago I lost my tripod, my tripod was here, and then um, a passing by, a farmer, was like, uh, look, 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 and I didn't realise, but my, 
my tripod had fallen and it was hanging down here and scraped and lost one of its legs and I didn't even know because I'm trying to listen to music to distract myself from the awful noise of the bike. And now, annoyingly, my beloved tie that I use to keep everything fastened and is pretty much one of the most important things I have has now somehow got caught around the chain. <sighs> I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do. To say this road is destroyed is an understatement. It's been an hour and a half of hell and I'm halfway there. So that's another hour and a half and then that's three hours back. Six hours just to get to an airfield, just to film five minutes of a vlog. Unfortunately, I didn't make it to the airfield. The road was too bad and I'm going to have to sit here and figure out how to get that out of the chain. Yeah, help. Come on. Okay. Yeah. Let me try. I tried to go to Long Chien. Long Chien. Long Chien. Long Chien. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Luckily, these guys just helped me. We used a machete to cut it free. <coughs> but yeah, I have to call it. We're not gonna be able to make it to the airfield, okay? I, I do want my kidneys to still be alive and functional. So I'm gonna turn around and do an hour and a half back on this hell road rather than six hours total. Sorry. My wallet. Okay, fun fact. Um, I've lost my wallet as well. Here you can see the aftermath of getting the the rope out of the chain and I had my wallet in here in my jacket pocket and I was thinking oh, I must have fallen out when I was lying down I'm trying to fix the bike. I mean honestly the road is so bouncy and so awful that my, my wallet which was in here might have just flown out. It had a million cash, my driving license and my ATM card. I'll try it one more time. This is like turning into the worst day ever. Oh my God. Well, we're gonna drive back and we're gonna keep an eye out for my, for my wallet. It's definitely not here. It's not in there, it's not in there. It's not in here, it's not in my bag. I mean, the chances of finding my wallet on this road, slim to none. Okay, I hope you guys can help me look for my wallet just for a minute, okay? I hope you don't mind. I've got to keep my eyes on these roads and you can keep an eye out for my brown wallet which my girlfriend bought me you know i i just knew today was going to be a bad day i woke up with a bad energy i just felt off i felt demotivated and i felt like almost i had to basically drag myself out of bed this morning to come out today and it happens sometimes nothing against laos or this place where I'm at. I was excited. There's an interesting story to be told and that makes content easy for me to film. But I just was in a weird place this morning. And then when I went for breakfast, I had like a really bad breakfast experience. I went to this nice cafe and we went back and forth. I used Google Translate, showed him pictures. All I wanted was a bacon and egg sandwich. And it was a cafe with sandwiches and they had sausages and eggs some reason it took us like 10 minutes back and forth and it still didn't come out you know he, he literally he brought out two fried eggs two of the smallest sausages in the world and no bread and at that point I thought to myself oh I hate it when my morning starts like this bad breakfast bad feeling something something's not gonna work out today sometimes when I get those feelings I should trust myself and just take the whole day off did you see the wallet I haven't seen it yet 
There's a beautiful scenic village coming up. Maybe we'll find it there. It's been about an hour going this slow. Haven't found it yet. This is the only village that I passed through. So I'm just going to drive through slowly and see if anybody waves me down. You know, like, oh, we found your wallet. Mr. Foreigner man, we found it. Also, it'd be nice to get a drink. Oh, I don't have any money. <laughs> oh yeah, I can't buy a drink if I don't have any money. Hello. Sabai, Sabai D. You guys are very dusty. Oh, okay. I don't think they found my wallet. They're cute though, aren't they? What a beautiful place to have a travel disaster. I think this is one of the most beautiful places on planet Earth, to be honest. I mean, imagine living here. Well, look at the mummy and the baby. Hello. Hi. Bye bye, Dee. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Bye bye, Nina. Okay. She hasn't seen a wallet. Um, I think I've got about an hour, maybe an hour and a half in front of me to get back to civilization and then we'll regroup. Hey buddy. You haven't seen my wallet, have you? Anywhere? <laughs> At the end of the day, these things happen, don't they? You have bad days. I think the moral of the story is, if you have a bad breakfast, just sack off the whole day and go back to bed. <laughs> to be fair, I was still slightly positive because just look at this place. I mean, a lost wallet, I can replace it. One million kip. I think it's about 60 US dollars. I mean, I was so annoyed about my license and my ATM, but whatever. Let's lick our wounds and crack on. <sighs> Look at the state of me. First things first, I need to cancel my card in case someone does find my wallet. You have no debit card. <laughs> okay. I don't have a debit card anymore, but that's fine. Next, I need to contact my girlfriend, tell her that I lost her the wallet that she bought me. Hey babe, um, I hope you're well, I hope you got back to Bangkok, okay. Listen, I went out filming today and long story short, I lost my wallet. It didn't come out of my jean pocket because I know it has a hole in it, but it was actually in my jacket pocket and the road was really bad and I think it fell out. But yeah, losing my wallet is annoying because you bought me it and I love that wallet and now I don't have a driving license. So let me know if you can uh, find any information, please. Love you, bye. So there's not really much else I can do. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is um, click my back, rest up a little bit for half an hour, and then we'll, 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 we'll go to the, the plane of jars, which I promise you is way more interesting than it sounds, okay? Um, and then we'll try and rescue this video because so far it's a bit of a shit show. I thought this video was gonna be one of my favorite videos to make. And because, I've just realized this, because I believe things come in threes, okay, especially bad things, they always come in threes, right? Bad breakfast, lost my wallet, and the bad, this is the worst thing, is tonight, Newcastle, my beloved Newcastle are playing Chelsea, and I know that means we're gonna lose. I know that means we're gonna lose tonight. We 
way here. Okay, we are here at the Plain of Jars, Site 1. Now, according to the map and the information provided, there's over 50 sites with thousands of these jars and we'll go take a look at them and we'll learn about them in a minute just looking at the state of Zelda absolutely covered in this dust as am I <laughs> this is a funny part of the world to travel in it's challenging but as you'll see we will be rewarded with something very unique and very interesting it is worth mentioning that the only reason why I'm here the only reason why I drove nine hours to get here from Lawang Prabang instead of going south, um, was because one of you guys messaged me on Instagram that you were actually part of the process, the years and years and years process, to make this site become a UNESCO World Heritage Site and protect it. Do I go in a truck? Do we walk or do we get into a little thing? I don't know. There's literally no information. There's one person working here eating a packet of crisps. And I can't fly the drone to show you this huge space because we're right next to the airport. Now, as I said, there's over 50 sites of these jars. And this is site number one. It's the one with the most information, which is the reason why I've come here. Oh, there's a visitor center. Let's quickly have a look at this. Maybe when we get there, we'll have a bit more information rather than just looking at a bunch of old jars. Maybe we'll understand what they are a bit more first. Okay, so that information center um, wasn't actually full of that much information. There was information there that in order to open this to the public, it had to be cleared of bombs and ordnance. And in doing so, they found over 127 unexploded bombs, ranging from small cluster bombs to huge, big, giant bombs. I'm kind of worried to, <laughs> to walk on the grass here in case we accidentally find the 128th uh, unexploded bomb. But the signage, walking trail, everything is really overgrown. And even though I'm 1000% sure that they've cleared all this of bombs and made it safe, I don't want to be, you know, risking it. So we won't be going too close. <laughs> we'll be sticking to the trail today. <laughs> I'm almost certain that from the visitor center, you're supposed to drive to the actual plane of the jars, site number one, instead of walking. Anyway, whilst we're walking to God knows where, let me set the scene for you. This is a 30, 40 kilometer square area with no trees, very little shrubbery, and very high up. It's a plateau in the middle of the mountains. And so this raised up platform it was the perfect place to stage a battle. There's lots of airstrips in near here. Obviously one we tried to get to this morning, couldn't get there. And here, there's another mystery. And something that was sadly the scene of one of the biggest battles in this war and the secret war, which we mentioned earlier. The Plain of Jars is not just a, a plain of nothingness and feels, no. It's home to an unsolved human mystery that I'll explain when we actually bloody get there. Because <laughs> I've been walking a long time. All the tourists are like, yeah, we're in the minivan, air conditioning, you idiot. we lay our eyes upon the first set of jars. Now these are up on the hill overlooking the plain itself. And so there's signage here where they seem to say that because this is the home to the largest jar, that surely this must have been the burial site of the king. Now the thing is, you see, everybody who has discovered these and tried to figure them out has assumed that this is some sort of human civilization that lived here thousands and thousands of years ago. We're talking before Angkor Wat and all of the, uh, you know, Angkor, Khmer people. 
<laughs> oh. Paddy the historian. Um, you, you guys can probably tell I'm very underprepared because I wanted to build myself up to this point and I've just been in a bit of a fuffle, for fuffle, kerfuffle today and so um, let me do my best okay so they were discovered and then they were just left alone for a long time until the 1930s when a French scientist a woman decided to really study these and when she started to examine these jars she found human remains teeth bones and sometimes she would find skeletons and even beaded necklaces and other things so they were clearly filled with human bodies now here's our first jar okay not the biggest but it's still huge okay and inside it's filled with water and there's somebody's baseball cap inside okay now behind me you can see smash jars and then all around you can see larger jars that are still standing so this is the largest of the jars it has a clearly human made carved lip and then you guys can have a little look inside and for scale let me put you down you can really see that at its, at its highest it's approaching two meters remember it goes into the ground as well so these things are huge okay let's discover a little bit more of these jars and come up with a theory how did they get here because this is like Stonehenge, you know, those famous stone formations. The most interesting part is that they realized that the stone itself came from hundreds of miles away further up towards the border of Scotland. And so the mystery is how the hell did the humans at that time with limited technology get the stone all the way there? Just like the mystery of how were the pyramids built 3000 BC, there wasn't the technology to do it. They still don't understand. And this is another type of human mystery, another type of spooky, unknown, unexplainable evidence that humans thousands of years ago had technologies that have either been wiped away, disappeared completely, um, and not shown themselves in any way other than just these relics of Stonehenge, the pyramid, and of course now these actual jars, these giant stone jars placed here in the plains, in the middle of nowhere here in Laos. Isn't that very mysterious? Let's take a closer look. Also, pay attention to the fact that this giant crater behind me, which apparently was created by a 600 pound bomb during the Vietnam War, it seemed to have sadly destroyed a lot of these jars right behind me, which were really close proximity to the king's jar behind me there so a lot of these jars did get destroyed and damaged and blown up there was also a secret war in this area where the lao army was fighting with um the, the aid of the americans fighting against the north vietnamese communist army and you know all of this was a battlefield you know it's difficult to fight and maintain position up in the mountains in every direction so these planes um were the perfect place to set up sniper positions, bases, and obviously airfields, and drop giant bombs like the one behind me. And back then, you know, during the war, they didn't care much about these jars because even, even back then there was very little known. Only recently did scientists come back and um, try to clean this place up, excavate it and discover some more uh, fascinating things because they want this to become a UNESCO World Heritage Site and I think finally it has been. Let's try to imagine something, okay? This one's a short fat one, tall, skinny, I mean very tall, taller than me, okay? Uh, and then this one is slanted. Now is, all, is this all just by chance or was that, you know, because that was the style of the person who died? Was it their wish to have that designed that way? Or was that just shaped on their body, you know? Was that the tallest guy in the village? And was that his kid? And was that his wife? And it's such an interesting thing to see these beautiful jars. And right now we're here walking on top of a trench. And, you know, there's even a jar as an entrance or an exit to one of the trenches. So can you imagine fighting in this long grass with these stone jars as almost as cover you know in 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 these battlefields 
you see it's littered <laughs> with giant craters. <laughs> yeah, so it's a juxtaposition of something super ancient, thousands year old mystery. Is he all right? Okay. <laughs> as well as the location of a horrible, horrific battle. Let's see if we can find some more interesting things other than the beautiful, incredible jars and the somber bomb craters and then these mysterious lids. Oh, I really like this one. This one's beautiful and nature has found its way to grow this gorgeous flower. Actually here you can actually see this is a lid. So it's almost, you know, gone into the ground, but you can see where this would have been a big circle. And then when they found them, they lifted them up and then inside, that's when they found like, oh, these aren't lids. These are just burial sites. But then you might be saying, okay, but Paddy, look at this one. It's obviously a lid. Look at it. <laughs> and uh, so that's why they thought that these were lids because a few of them did actually have lids on top. What is the common theory is that that was just put on there by some humans later on because it doesn't actually match. It's not smoothly done. There seems to be no workmanship. Uh, you know, it just doesn't, it's not a smooth fit. You know, it could have even been some bored soldiers who were sick of digging a trench decided to pick up this and put it on there. You don't know, right? So they're saying that even though this particular jar does have a lid, that in closer inspection, it just doesn't make sense. If you do have a look, it doesn't actually seem to fit. Almost like Cinderella's shoe or something. It's like, hang on a minute, it's a bit fishy this. Too good to be true. I tell you what, this is worth coming to. Not if you're fascinated by stone jars, okay? But actually just the, the whole environment here is extremely pleasant and we're saving the best to last because there's a huge cave over there. But I'm trying to find there's a special lid, but I haven't quite seen it yet. I hope I haven't missed it. And yeah, I think that's my favorite thing about this whole place is the way that it's done. You know, it's, you do feel like you can explore. There's large areas of grass that they've cut and then they've cleared it of bombs. So you do, you do feel like you can try to solve the mystery yourself by walking around, imagining who made these, why would they make them? How did they get them here? And also picture yourself in the Navy or the army, sorry fighting here in the 70s with planes flying over it all kind of adds to it okay so in keeping with the theme of this video and everything going wrong i can't find the lid that i'm looking for it doesn't seem to be signposted anywhere and i can't find it for the life of me however um someone i've met and he's a really nice guy and his YouTube channel is called The True Budget Traveller. He came here, he was actually trapped in Laos during the whole COVID thing, and he made the best of it by traveling around. And he did come here, and when I was researching the plane of jars, I found his video, and I watched some of it, uh, because it was very interesting, but I also didn't want to watch all of it because I don't want to ruin it for myself. But he found the lid with the human figure on the top, and it's missing a head, but you can clearly see arms, legs, and a body and it's the only lid in this area that does seem to have any kind of engraving on it which is just further evidence that yes it was sculpted but again it asks more questions than gives answers doesn't it why does that lid have a human on it and why was it lying on the floor next to all of these other huge jars you know what i mean this whole thing is just confusing wondrous mysterious mystical but also very frustrating because being a human we want the concrete answer there's very few concrete answers one of which that is concrete is just over here actually by the way this is not actually concrete people thought they were concrete for the longest time but then it was discovered that it was granite from at least five kilometers away because this local area doesn't have any of this rock which again is just another 
source of mystery and questions and no answers. How did they get them here? How did they make them? Why are they here? Why do they not have lids? What's the purpose? Why is the big one on the hill? Surely that was the leader or the king or the queen. We don't know because there was no evidence of any civilization living in this area except for these giant jars. But there is one final thing behind me, the cave. And the cave has some significance, I'll show you. Okay, welcome to the finale of the Plain of Jars, site number one. Remember, <laughs> plenty of other sites. This just particular one has the cave, and I think this is probably the reason why this place is so famous. So the two things to note with the cave, the first is during the war, this was somewhere that the soldiers would come to hide from the giant bombings. And the second reason it's important is that it's been not proven, but thought of that this was used as a crematorium. This is where they came to burn bodies, burn the dead. And the reason why they think that is that because they only found burnt remains in here, as well as black smoke markings that go up the cave wall, and that there's two human man-made holes at the, at the top of the cave. If you're still with me, firstly, thank you. Secondly, hit the smash the like button. Um, what do you think is the, the reason for these jars? They obviously had human remains, but why were they buried and why here? Why in Laos? Why not really anywhere else? Apparently there are jars in Northern India and in Indonesia as well. Let me tell you what I think, okay? Now I think, as we all know, the Egyptians were ruled and governed by futuristic aliens that came here from another galaxy, taught them how to make pyramids, gave them technology and hieroglyphics and then they left and the Egyptians ended up just killing themselves and the civilization disappeared, leaving only pyramids for scientists to scratch their heads at how they were made. Clearly it was alien civilization. And then <laughs> over in Cambodia, you've all known about the, you know, the Chimera Angkor Wat temples. Now they date back very, very long time ago, but way, way before those temples of Angkor Wat, there's actually pyramids in Cambodia and maybe we'll go see some soon and they date back to thousands of years ago and I think that potentially what happened is the galaxy aliens came to earth they liked the hot weather so they went to Egypt and they built a civilization there but they also liked the temperature up here in Laos and decided that this was the perfect burial place and then their technology was taught to the human civilization here where they built the jars, then that's kind of just like a simple thing for them. Like, oh yeah, we just get a jar, it's just like a coffin. And they would just use a special kind of laser beam that would shoot the mountain, blow it up into perfect jar shapes. And then some sort of spaceship would bring it over here easily, drop it on the ground. And then that's where you would bury your auntie or your grandma. And maybe the big one was for the, the leader of the village. And then when the aliens left, they just decided to destroy everything, you know, not leave anything uh, except for the jars to annoy future civilizations um, with like a mystery of like, how did this get here? And, you know, that's what I think. So I think it's, you know, pretty obvious that it was um, alien interference and they didn't leave anything behind just like they did in Egypt other than the ginormous pyramids um, and, you know, all sorts of other things like hieroglyphics and beautiful artwork and sphinxes and all of the rest of it so that's what i think happened this is all aliens 